Okay. <laughs> okay, um, beauty. It honestly does define the world we live in nowadays, especially as we are hyper-focused on aesthetics. So before I start, I offer a question to the audience. Who here considers themselves attractive? <laughs> oh, guys, it's a bit disheartening, but... Okay, and who here, consider, who, who here considers themselves conventionally attractive? Oh, okay. <laughs> and I stress the use of the word conventional here because, quite frankly, to some extent, all beauty is subjective. After all, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And as we see within our society, within <laughs> maybe I should not say trash for beauty, but... <laughs> As we see within our society, we become very hyper-focused on aesthetics. Nowadays, everyone's trying to alter themselves and change themselves to see how they can fit better into the beauty standard. But the big question comes in, where did the beauty standard come in? After all, people who are more conventionally attractive can get out of things. For example, a person who is more conventionally attractive can get paid more. In some extreme cases, which has been seen in the media, people can get out of, say, the criminal justice system. Or better yet, they get simply get treated better. And these situations sound insane. They don't sound realistic, but it's the truth. So the question is, who set up beauty standards and who really cares? If we're all adhering to said beauty standards, does it really matter that it exists? And I would like to tell you the answer is yes, but no, really. Beauty standards do matter, especially nowadays, with over 3.4 million people within the UK alone have an eating disorder. The problem is beauty is quite literally killing us, and we are letting it. But the big question here is, well, why? Why are we so hyper-focused on beauty? And more importantly, why does everyone here in the audience today not view themselves as attractive? Well, the real thing is here, you're not ugly, you're just human. <laughs> How do I ask you? Oh, I was, I was pressing the button, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so here on the board, as you can see here, is a picture of a woman. And you may think, that woman looks very familiar. That's because it's the same woman done nine times. I don't think that's a big shock. But um, as you can see, in the, every single picture here, the woman has been changed to fit the beauty standard of that country. So, for example, in Japan, the woman's eyes have been made to have a double island, that island, eyelid. <laughs> her face is paler and her face has been, shaped, has been like, made to a V-shape, whereas with the United States, her eyebrows have been raised, but her skin is more of a white complexity and her face is a bit wider. But as you can see, the beauty standards differ from, differ from country to country because, quite frankly, the beauty standard differs from location to location because that's what people really prefer. But to really understand the thing of beauty standards is that we need to dive deep into actually where they came from and the culture behind it. And obviously, we're not all going to adhere to beauty standards because, quite frankly, we're not computer software people who can edit our faces in real life. Shock horror, oh my goodness. <laughs> but as we see here, obviously, beauty standards do change, but the real question is here, why? What actually is beauty? Now to take it back a bit more, these two women are the epitome of beauty within our countries. So starting from the left, we have the Ken no, we have the Mercy tribe from Ethiopia here, from the Omo Valley, where women are from around age five, not age five, age 15, put lip, put lip plates in. What happens is that the teeth at the, bottom, at the bottom are removed, the lip is stretched, and the plate goes in. And as you continue through the years, the plate gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as you can see as well, we have ear stretching. And the bigger the plate, the more attractive and the more feminine you are. Whereas the girl on the right here has got the neck rings of the Kayan tribe, of the Kali tribe within Myanmar. And here, a woman's neck, how long a woman's neck is considered how attractive they are. And the neck, these neck rings can weigh up to four and a half pounds each, and they get bigger and they get thicker as you continue down. And these two women are considered the most beautiful type of women within their own culture. And the crazy thing is, obviously, from a Western perspective, this may seem cruel or ridiculous or somewhat out of hand. And to some extent, you'd be right, but obviously beauty differs from place to place. And the big question is, well, if wh why would they do this? And actually, I challenge that perspective, why would we do this? Because quite frankly, these women are doing what we do. They're trying to adhere to their beauty standards. And although it may seem a bit insane to us, obviously, when you actually put it into perspective, these women are just doing exactly what it is takes to fit in. So let's go back in history a bit. I present to you the Golden Lotus. You're very lucky. I just say you're quite lucky. I got told not to put the actual foot picture in. It is a, <laughs> it's a lot worse. But the Golden Lotus it was originates from around the 1660, 6000 BC, and and obviously is pre present in the 10th century. And it, and it originates in China. And the story of the Golden Lotus was the emperor had a dancer at the time, and this dancer's feet were shaped in the form of a golden lotus. And she danced in a golden lotus, and the two got married. And the woman was very blessed. And at the time when the story first originated, rich women in China, who had nothing else to do because they were rich and rich people don't work at the time, sit down and crush their feet and they would do it. And essentially, this foot practice became a standard of elitists. 
like it was a form of elitism, it was a form of power, it was a form of status, it was a form of beauty, and it was a form of wealth. And eventually, this trickled down into just Chinese culture. And for a long time, a woman would not be able to get a marriage offer if her feet was bigger than four inches, which is, by the way, smaller than most iPhones. So imagine that. Imagine having a foot that's that small, and if you actually were to carry the size of the shoe right now, it would be in your hand. So how does this terrible practice happen? Okay, ready for this? Your foot from around age five, so this is very young, what they do, they get the feet, they bathe it in a mixture of warm water and pig and animal blood, you get the toes and you crush them in and then you break the heel. And, essentially, and then you bind the foot up and every say few days or so, oh, you've still got to cut the toenails, but every few days or so, they'd unwrap the foot. Everyone, everyone looks so disgusted, I promise you, it's okay. It's not okay, but... <laughs> But um, you crush the foot, you bind it up, and essentially, over the years, these, these feet would turn into the shape of a golden lotus, and essentially, your foot would look like a shoe. Obviously, it was very painful, and you were kind of disabled because you couldn't walk anymore because your feet are crushed. It was honestly a horrific thing, but that was, what, that was the standard at the time. That was the beauty standard, and women would do this. But the problem is, for the poorer classes, who obviously didn't have the luxury of not working all day, they were essentially unable to work, and women became very dependent on their husbands. And actually, this practice continued up until around modern-day China in the, 1900, in the 90s, the 1900s, where essentially they went, actually, we're going to ban it, because obviously people couldn't walk. And it got banned, but essentially, there are still people today who are living with crushed feet. They are living history within our day. And the quick question is, well, the beauty standard then is crazy. But it existed. And at the time, it was seen as a sign of power and class. And it's crazy. And to be fair, the foot, st the foot standard was compared to the Victorian obsession with the waist. So when the Queen Victoria came to the throne in the 1800s, with her, came, with her came a new set of beauty standards. And Victorian society was, quite frankly, one of the most rigid ones in terms of morality, in terms of sexuality, and in terms of beauty. So in terms of beauty, a lot of new products came up. At the time, makeup was seen as geography, and actually it's for loose women, but people still put makeup on anyway. Um, hairstyles became really big and extravagant, but the biggest thing about the Victorian beauty standard was the tiny, tiny waist. And the tiny waist would change completely throughout the course of Queen Victoria's reign. So originally when the corset first came in, it actually wasn't meant to crush your ribs or anything. It was just meant to shape play you, make you into more of a... I don't know, pervy sort of person, but around, I want to say, 1859, it changed, because that was when corsets became a big boom and a big thing. And all of a sudden, corsets were done to make you have a tiny, tiny waist and massive, well, I don't think I'm allowed to say in a TED talk, but <laughs> I think you can imagine what I'm going for. And the sort of um, fashion that they had at the time is still very prevalent in our society today, but obviously these women were crushing themselves in, and they were essentially suffering in the name of beauty. And it sounds insane, but obviously, Beauty standards are quite arbitrary, and they change a lot throughout time. This case, the, okay, the doll experiment of the 1940s was fundamental in winning the Brown versus Board case in 1953, which would desegregate schools, although schools wouldn't actually be desegregated for another 10 years afterwards with the Civil Rights Act. But the doll's experiment proved something that we can actually still see today, which is unconscious racial bias, which doesn't necessarily link into my talk, but it's quite important. So what happened with the um, doll experiment was Kenneth and Mamie Smith... Clark even, um, got these children and they set, presented them a set of dolls. And these, this experiment was actually repeated in, I think, 2008. And they presented these kids a set of dolls. And these dolls were the exact same. There was no difference between them except for skin colour. And, and this test person asked, what doll was the good one? What doll was the bad one? What doll was the pretty one? What doll is the ugly one? What doll is good? What doll is bad? And what we saw at the time, which is the effect of, deseg of segregation even, was that the black doll got all the negative connotations and the white doll got all the positive connotations. And obviously that seems ridiculous, but beauty standards at the time were focused on the white women. The white woman was the good person and the black person was the bad person. And obviously these are little kids. We're talking about children from ages three to five here who have no concept of, say, race, have no concept of racism, but yet somehow what they've been fed has taught them what they should believe, much like the beauty standard today, which leads me quite nicely into the beauty standard people of colour. Now, whether we like to admit it or not, the beauty standard for people of colour is more extreme in a sense because when the beauty standard first came in, well, it shifted. As you can tell, by, if we go back to my first slide, if we go back here, well, the big thing that we see within all our, all our women on the board is that all of them have a light complexion, including the women from India, even though most people from India are actually of darker complexion. In fact, it was only, we say recently, we say the stuff of Bridgerton and stuff, that we finally start to see darker skinned women in the media, but obviously people still prefer lighter skinned women. And the reason for that 
is a cause of colonization. Whether we like to admit it or not, the impact of colonization was huge and it really did affect the beauty standard. Now, does anybody know what the product on the top is? Fair and lovely, has anyone heard of it before? If you don't know what it is, it's a skin lightening product because skin lightening is considered all the range within South Asia and Africa. It's actually advertised quite a lot. When I went to Ghana, I remember that they were advertising it on TV. And fair and lovely essentially is this bleaching product that would make your skin lighter. For the women on the bottom, essentially with black hair, which um, George, as George has mentioned recently, um, it's more fashionable to look as white as possible within your hair cells. So even braids are seen as a bad thing, but weaves are seen as fantastic. But obviously the problem here is that, well, then people damage themselves to fit into the beauty standard. For me, up until about year, I wanna say nine or so, I straightened my hair, but not with normal straightener. We have this thing called a relaxer, which if you don't know what a relaxer is, it's this chemical and it really burns your head for a few minutes or so. And then you wash it off and your hair becomes straight. Obviously it really damaged the hair, but at the time we didn't know that it would be so bad because uh, all we thought was that, oh, you can be more beautiful if your hair is straight, which is honestly a terrible thing to think. But at the time, people will do whatever it does to fit into the beauty standard. So now we've explored the beauty standard a bit through history and we see right now that, well, the beauty standard is always changing. It's always differing from country to country, from century to century. What's in today will not be in tomorrow, as we can see with the Kardashians and the fact that they recently got rid of their um, BBLs, so butts are no longer in fashion. Well, my goodness. <laughs> But obviously, it changes all the time. So how do we approach the issue of beauty standard in a more normal way? And the answer to that is body neutrality. The beauty standard today. The thing is, we say, is that if we can put body positivity, although it is a good thing to be positive, if we're always focusing on trying to love ourselves because of certain attributes, we're never truly going to be happy with ourselves. Because quite frankly, when you attach so much importance to a thing, well, then you're going to find a problem with it. No one can love themselves 100% of the time. And it would be ridiculous to suggest that you would because everyone has their up days and their down days. And if you say you don't, you're a liar. But with, <laughs> but with body neutrality, we can learn to appreciate ourselves because quite frankly, the love shouldn't be conditional. Your love for your body should not be conditional. And say we would do this, we take the focus off of beauty standards whatsoever, completely. I do believe that beauty standards make an important part of our, his of our history. It's an important part of our culture. But I say body neutrality is the answer. So instead of going, oh, wow, I really like my legs because they're so long or they're so short or they're very muscular, I would say love your legs because they help you to walk. You have the ability to see with your eyes, you can listen with your ears, you can, yeah, you can walk with your legs and you can use your hands, such as this. So to finish my statement, you're not ugly, you're human. As you can see, the beauty standard changes a lot throughout time. And fr quite frankly, we cannot control this. But I am going to finish with a quote that I promised myself I would do, but it's not on this, yes. I'm going to finish with a quote from one of the, I think, the most influential people of our time, which is um, One Direction. So, you don't know, oh, oh, you don't know you're beautiful. Thank you for listening. <laughs>